I want to go to 1 Timothy chapter 4 and verse 14. Paul talking to a young pastor, speaking to him in interesting tones for us. I spoke to you two weeks of children. You may be dismissed if you want to let you go. Now that you're already in the alley. <laughs> Spoke to you, are we getting out of life what we want? That's a decision we make. We can't always handle the results, but the results come in so many ways because of the choices that we make. And so, Paul gave some good counsel to young Timothy that he gives to all the church. As we read in 1 Timothy Chapter 4, beginning with verse 14. Now, as you read, as I read this, make sure that you reflect on Timothy is already a pastor. So he's not calling him into ministry. He's not calling him to do something he's not doing. Something else is going on. 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 14. Do not neglect the gift that is in you which was given to you by prophecy with the laying on of hands of the eldership. Meditate on these things. Give yourself entirely to them that your progress may be evident to all. And the last verse says, Take heed to yourself and to the doctrine. Continue in them, for in doing this, you will save both yourself and those who hear you. That last part is confirming what I've already told you. There's people already listening to you. So I'm not calling you to preach. I'm asking you to stir up the gift that yeah. God has put within you yeah. because people are listening to what you're saying. So I ask us, after we know what we want our goals we are, then we need to know what investment we're making and whether the investments that we're making is going to pursue the goals we've laid out. Father, I ask your blessings, your continued blessings to be upon us as we hear your word. For God, it's not my job to convince anybody in this room. Because God, I'm not anybody that should be listened to. I am, I'm Eric Brian Brock from Greenwood, South Carolina. I am no one special. But I have opened the Word of God. I have spoken an over 2,000 year old book. And dear Heavenly Father, you have worked this book through the lives of countless generations. It has changed in a positive manner all those who have taken seriously these words that you have revealed to us. So God, I'm not important, but these words are. So dear Heavenly Father, I ask that you would help us all, including the speaker. To hear the words that the Spirit would say today to our hearts. To not cast them off as the mere words of a man behind the pulpit. But to hear God speak to us today. For no man really can move us. But oh God, you can. And it's our responsibility to respond to you with courage and with character. So Father, have your way in our hearing and in our lives today. In Jesus' name. Amen. Life is busy. Anybody found that out yet? <laughs> it seems to get busier, doesn't it? Now look at my calendar. Okay, this week looks good. And then all of a sudden it's Friday. Where did this week go? We're busy, busy. So many things take our attention. So many things want our time, wants our energy, wants our money. So many things. It's not just a few. So many things. So we were sitting here today, and again, I appreciate you being here today. A visitor or a regular, thank you for being here today because you've made a choice where you are today and how you're living your spiritual life. So how do we balance these goals that we have? How do we balance all our pursuits, our longings, our responsibilities with discipleship too? I mean, either spiritual things are going to be important to us or they're just going to be a sideline issue. They're going to be a hobby that we have that we pick up and put down at our leisure. How do we balance all these things if truly the goal of a spiritual life is always before us? A lot of times we are affected by those things in the different aspects of our lives that are can't miss opportunities. Whether it's overtime or whether it's this opportunity to invest in or, or this special thing that's come up, 
And it seems that special things come up all the time. You just can't miss this. In fact, that's one of the that's one of the best ways people get you in the store. You just cannot miss this opportunity, as if like there won't be one six months down the road. But we feel that pressure, and if we live our lives according to the can't misses that we've come up with, then something else is is preying on our emotions, our feelings, our goals, and our investments more than the will of God. Because the will of God is not a pressure tactic. It's, it's not a, you must do this or I'm going to blow you up before you get out of the sanctuary. That's not God. God calls. God draws. God speaks. And we are given much more time. Much more time than probably we could even imagine that we've been given time what do we give our investment and our time to? Again, I could list many different things. I'll list just a few gen general ones. Business, give a lot of hours to. And in this climate, it seems like you can never give enough time to them. They always want just a few hours more of your time, no matter how many, how many hours it is. But they're, their bottom line's money, so they live according to that. You could give hours and hours in house and yard work and in sports and hobbies and relationships and school, etc. Even in church work itself, you can give hours and hours and hours and hours too. And I'm not saying any of these things are bad. But what is our goal that we talked about two weeks ago? What's the end result? When all is said and done and your name is written on the epitaph, what do you want people to have said about you? What was so obvious about your life that you literally invested more than anything else in your life in that singular pursuit? What was it? Our lives, I believe, will show it. And if we want to know, it's not hard to know. Just pull out a calendar. And start recording for the week what you're doing, hour upon hour. And you'll be surprised, most probably, at what takes your hours up. You think, I don't have that much taking up my time. You'd be surprised. I have been often surprised at the number of, of hours that I thought were just minutes. They were just a little snippets here or there. But they turned into great chunks of time. I was, I was being, my time was being consumed and not always did it meet the goals that I have for my life. Let me tell you how Paul couched to Timothy the importance of investment in what is important in your life. The first thing he shares with Timothy in, in, in verse 14, he says, do not neglect the gift that is in you. I, I love this verse because again, he's already a preacher. He's already pastoring. He's already ministering. But while preaching is a calling, there are gifts that go with that calling. There are gifts, I can speak of compassion, of, of understanding people, of handling people in crisis. That's, those are all skills, and there's many different skills that are in the pastoral ministry. But he says, there's a gift that's specifically been placed in you. Don't neglect it. You can become so busy with other things that you forget what God calls you to. You forget what God has wanted you to do because God has put something special in every person that is on this planet and you ought to be using that gift for God. You ought not discover it when you're old. You ought to know it as soon as you can and you ought to, you ought to pursue that gift. Don't neglect the gift that is in you. The greatest gift I think we've all been given, not specifically talking about the spiritual gifts He gives to us, God wants a relationship with us. Amen. You know that? He wants you to have a source that nobody else has. If you know God, of course you can, but, but there's no other source, there's no other person quite like God. Now, I'm going to tell you, the government wants that job. They want to be God to you. They do. You, you think I'm lying? Well, I, I, there was, there was, I, just, I just read a report in, in London. And I know London does a little bit of stuff different than us, but they are our cousins from across the pond. I mean, we're the same type people here. They have a lot of ministers, but now they're minister of sports. I didn't know you needed one of those, but I guess you have to have a minister of sports in the house of lords now. And also, she happens to be the minister of, of civil attitudes. I didn't know you need to have a minister of civil attitudes, but here in the way people talk today, there's a whole lot of people need some civil attitudes and they deal with each other. But now she's had a new job description. She is also now the minister of loneliness. So the British government is going to tackle the crisis of loneliness within its citizens. You know, I think that's God's job. God's a friend that sticks closer than a brother. God is with me. He walks with me. He ministers.
church to me. So the church should be the place where people find their friend that never leaves them. But now the government says, I can do that for you. We're going to pull the best minds together. Well, bless your heart. Go ahead and try. And I'm, not, I'm sure they will do some fine things. But if you want someone that's with you, government can't provide that. God said, I want you to be with me. And unless you come to me, something in your heart's always going to be empty. He's provided us with such a great gift. That and all blessings He's given to us today. But whether you know or not your gift, if you don't know it, you talk to me. We're going to pray about it. Because they'll find it. I'll make sure you find it. But notice what else He says in that verse. He says, don't neglect what God's put inside of you because this is something that you've got. It's unique to you and God can use it. I think so many times... What could some of these talented people outside of the church that's done so much to shape our culture in this technological age, what could they have done if they'd have been using those talents for the glory of God? I imagine they wouldn't have had to been standing before Congress for perhaps unethical things that they're doing with people's information. Uh, uh, but, you know, I can't fully say that. But I just wonder, gifts are given by God. What would they do if they gave them to God and not neglect those for His purposes? But notice that second part. Which was given to you by prophecy. God gave. He's not man called. He's not mom and daddy church called. He is God called. This is a prophetic word. You are to do this in the church because that's what God has gifted you to do. But notice what else it says. With the laying on of hands of the eldership. Can I tell you something? And I know I'm prejudiced as I say this, but hey, you can't root for your own team. What you doing on? I think I think there's too little that we need from the church today. I think we look to too many other places what we should be looking to the church for. Timothy was called. The prophetic word came out. But elders' hands were still laid on top of him. Did they call him? No, they didn't call him. No man can call you. I would not dare call anyone to the ministry. I am not God and the church is not God. It is not your Lord. But I have to say, the church is God's chosen vessel to administer His grace. If you want to find where His grace flows through, you've got to look to the church. That's what He's chosen. Not me. He did it. So if that grace has been given, then we ought to look to the church to help those gifts flourish that God has given to us. The prophetic word came for Timothy, but the elders said, we bless you in the name of the Lord and we will help you to flourish in this ministry. That's why Paul was writing the letter. Because he's going to lay hands on people and leave them. He keeps on investing in this young man that he believes God has great things for. I know there's so much investment that this church does. Uh, so much in, in, in our children, so much in our in our adult worship, in our adult Sunday schools. We have so much investment. I know even in the musical, there's, there's, there's about half a dozen people or more in this church that invest in, in, in people's musical gifts that are here in this church. Why? Because that's what the church does. We help people to flourish. We help people to be all they can be for God because that's our calling. That's an investment. That's a choice. And it's an easy one to make. God placed gifts. We just invest interests and blessings in pursuing those gifts. I have to say last week, last Sunday evening, our graduates went to, to Siloam and Reverend Dan Smith spoke a powerful word to our graduates. It was an absolutely outstanding message. And you, you take some graduate words out of there and it's a message that hits every heart and every life. He, he knows, he knows what he was preaching them very well. Um, the, the, the need for God and the need for continued growth and, and using the gift that's in him. In his 60s now. It's so, it's a powerful moment that I knew they wouldn't understand, but I had the privilege to understand. As he's telling them to pursue God and what God has in front of them, here's a man that just completed his doctorate in the 60s. A lot of people said, um, Dan, you're kind of old. <laughs> to be pursuing a doctor, to, be, to put, a, put a blunt point on it. But he pursued it. 
be accomplished. Yeah. And now God has opened up more avenues of ministry for him. You know what? When you don't neglect the gift God's put into you, you may put yourself after pastor, but I'm going to tell you God doesn't because we ought not neglect. We ought to bless and send forward God's gifts imparted into people that are all around us at this very present moment. But let's move quickly to that second part. That second part says, I want you to meditate on these things I've told you. Don't neglect the gift that's in you. Think about these things. In the English Standard, it says, practice these things. Immerse yourself in them. In the New American Standard, it says, take pains with these things. Be absorbed in them so that your progress will be evident to all. If God's gifted to your progress, What's sad is those people who said, yeah, I, I knew God called me to do this, but I never did anything with it. That is a tragedy. You've invested in something that now you regret. You can make investments. You can make bad investments just like you can make bad monetary investments. But God wants you to progress. He wants you to emerge greater in the things He's called you to. And that takes practice. That takes little investment of your time. The Harvard Business Review wrote in acquiring new skills in work, and there's always a need in this modern age to require new skills. He says you need to ask yourself two things, and I add one other, one other uh, thing from that, from that article. First, your goal must be attainable. What you want to do, can you do it? If you can't do it, don't waste your time. There are certain limits to what you can learn. And their, their example is you may want to be a brain surgeon, but if you don't have good hands, forget it. It ain't happening. So make sure it's attainable. But second, and a very crucial one, I think, how much time and energy can you give to the project? Because unless your goal is attainable, and unless you're prepared to work hard, you won't get very far. Eliciting, the third thing is that eliciting support from others can greatly increase learning. Find someone you trust who's mastered the skill you're trying to attain. In other words, you've got to work hard to get anywhere with the gift God's given you. God dispenses it on you, but you still got to get out there and work it. You still got to use it. You still got to meditate on it and let God develop it in you. I was called at five years old. You know what? I couldn't preach at five years old. I couldn't preach at ten. We're not going to ask if I can preach still yet. But I'm still, I still, I know the calling and I know the development that it's taken over the years. It's the same thing for you. It's the same thing for every person. You've got to practice those things. And here's where the rub really comes in. Where's all our energies going? Where is it going to go? Because, again, everything around you clamors for your attention. And, and let me just say, uh, many, many realms do, do this, but I was, I was reading an article about, it was, in, it was in a Minnesota paper, and they were talking about this, the sports season coming up, and they, they mentioned to a hockey player that was, that was playing in, in their hockey league in the development, not quite in the development, but the, the youth league that, that kind of is training ground for the training grounds, which will eventually be the ultimate the ultimate, um, the ultimate play in the hockey leagues. But he says, how long is hockey season? And he told him, it's 13 months. <laughs> what that means is it never seems to end. Once you finish playing, then you've got to get back to practicing. And then you've got to get back to lifting. And, and then you, you've got to do all these things. It seems to never end. And there's a lot of things like that. Just want more and more and more and more from you. You've got to practice to get good. But what is your ultimate goal in life. That's where the decisions really have to come for us because we want the, the ultimate goal of this, what he says at the end of this, progress evident to all. You want your progress to be seen for it to be obvious to everyone around you. I, I know investing, investing time just this weekend with a man. I want to thank TB for for, for putting together that weekend and having that time. I enjoyed that time. It's, it's a meaningful time for me because I don't get to see the men of the church in that realm all the time. And I felt as we're ending it, we ought to do this more. We ought to have this more because I feel closer to the men when we get together. I, I, feel, I feel better when we interact with each other uh, more than just in service. That's an investment of time. And that's wanting to, to build up our men's ministry. The women do the same thing in November. We get closer when we invest in the things that, that are most important. And God says, I want you to be together. I don't want you to be apart. I want you to be together. So guess where his blessings come? His blessings come when you practice what you've been preaching. When you put investment and energy into what you say is most important to you. 
But let me add the third one here as we bring this to a close. Because this is as fundamentally as important as the other two. Not only to not neglect the gift and to practice so that progress will be seen, but take heed to yourself. What is this investment doing in you? And what is it producing out of you? That's very important questions to ask. He says, take heed to yourself. Take heed to your doctrine. In other words, what do you believe? Because what you believe will affect how you live and the decisions that you make in your life. Paul elevates it to the ultimate end. Your life affects you. Your beliefs affect how you live. Your belief systems affect every decision that you make every day. If, if, if church is a one-hour proposition, let me tell you, it is not what's driving your life. If, if church is not, if, if being the church, not making it a building, but being the church is not your firm priority, then an hour or two will suffice. But if it is your main priority to be His body and to be His hands and feet, then it will consume every day of your life. You will look to what is, what is, what am I held accountable for? What's God going to ask me when I see Him? When He comes back in all of His glory, He's going to look at me eye to eye and He says, let me see your time sheet and let me see your checkbook. I want to see how you lived your life, not what you believe. Don't tell me what's in your head. Tell me what your hands did. Tell me what your mouth did. Tell me what your heart pursued. Tell me those things because those things are the real stuff of life. And not only does it affect you, but it affects those around you. Look at the polls. Look at how this country is changing. Why? Because people are seeing more and more peer pressure going in a certain direction. And they are responding by giving into it. It's a simple matter of peer pressure. They, they have not, they are, they're not battling. They're just going with what's easy and what is, is best for their condition at the moment. Your doctrine matters. So if we were more free than we've ever been, and according to the recent legislation we should be, then why are we having so much trouble? Why is violence a problem? I'm here to tell you, the church is not the reason why violence is widespread in this world. Why are we having issues with each other? We can't even talk to each other, one another. Why is that problem here? It is because we are pursuing our hearts, a certain doctrine, and that doctrine has consequences. Just like there's a doctrine that pulled this nation together and took us through two world wars and many smaller ones through a hundred years of time, so that same doctrine left will produce consequences in all those around. It's unavoidable. It's inescapable. And I want to tell you, looking back at life will give you perfect vision, I guess you should say. And I want to share with you, I shared this before, but I want to share it again. Um, this is a person that had an advantage to look at the back of their life and, and share with others what they thought about their lives. And this is what they said about both the, the, the connection between their doctrine and then how they lived their life. They said, when I look back over the schedule that I kept for 30 or 40 years ago, I'm staggered by all the things that we did. Were all these engagements really necessary? Every day I was absent from my family is gone forever. Although much of the travel was necessary, some of it, looking back, it was not. I would, looking back now, I would spend more time in spiritual nurture. I would spend more time seeking to grow closer to God so that I could become more like Christ. I would spend more time in prayer, not just for myself, but for others. I would spend more time in the Bible, spend more time meditating on His truth. I would also give more attention to fellowship with other Christians. So they would teach me and encourage me and even rebuke me when it was necessary. But about one thing, I have absolutely no regrets. That's my commitment many years ago to accept God's calling to serve Him as an evangelist of the gospel of Christ. It's a man who lived for God. He had nine plus, he had nine decades to live for God. But looking back over those nine decades, he says... My investments were not always where they should be. My doctrine was a little watered down by other things, and it affected me, and it affected those around me. 
Reverend Billy Graham had a, a, a unique experience to tell us. You know what? Most of us don't get nine decades to make those decisions. Most of us don't have that length of time to say, okay, this is what's right and this is what I should have been giving my life to. That's why it's important that we recognize today, like Paul was telling Timothy in these young days, you need to, you need to stir up this, this gift that's in you. You need to practice it and you need to pursue this to such an extent that your doctrine and your life not only affects you, but it affects those around you. Let me end this with bringing us back to how we, we center the service around Memorial Day. Because in a secular sense, this is still what we're talking about. This world, this, 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 this nation of ours invested in freedom. And invested our young men and women to this day with that cause of freedom. And let me just tell you, in World War II, we gave 291,551 souls, 57 souls. During the Civil War, we gave 214,000 938 souls. World War I, 53,402. Vietnam, 47,000. Korean War, 33,000. Revolutionary War, 8,000. The Iraq War, 3,000. The War of 1812, 2,000. The War of Afghanistan, 1,800. Mexican-American War, 1,700. For a total, to this point, and there will be wars in the future, we've invested 1 million 498,240 lives to war. To fighting for freedom. To, to believing in what is good because not all these felt bold and they just wanted, they just wanted their family to say they want to see their, their girlfriend one more time. But they fought for good. They fought for freedom. And yes, some of them, like in World War II, knew they were fighting evil and evil to fight it. You don't play patty cake. You shed blood to destroy it. And we sit here realizing that what Paul said 2,000 years ago is true. Pay attention to what you believe. Because what you believe not only affects you, it affects those around you. Or as God would have us to be, I like the way Paul said it. Paul said, if you continue in this, in a spiritual purpose, you will not only save yourself, you will save those around you. What we forget is they died so we don't have to. They gave their lives so I've never had to go to a foreign conflict. I've never had to leave my country other than on a missions trip. Never had to. It has saved me from that conflict. That is worth remembering in Memorial Day, but I ask you to stand.